In this video, we will learn about the special tests that are required to fully assess patients with neuroendocrine tumors. We will learn why neuroendocrine tumors are different, what are these special tests and scans that can help in managing these patients. And it is important to underline that these tests and scans are not available in most hospitals, starting with why that are different. So neuroendocrine tumors originate from tissue that produces hormones. Hormones are chemicals that have biologic function in the body. They're also different because their behavior can be from very benign taking years and years to, to progress to highly malignant and aggressive cancers because they originate from tissue that produces hormones they may secrete hormones and chemicals that have function in the body and these are often out of control causing severe symptoms some of these may have a genetic component and it may occur in families now let's review some of the tests with that background neuroendocrine tumors are either functional that is hormone producing and non-functional tumors that do not produce hormones, but they do produce other chemicals that are present in the blood. It is thus very important to measure the level of hormones in the blood, and let's look into that. As you can see from this table, the common sites of neuroendocrine tumors, which is the lung, the small bowel, colon, rectum, and pancreas. And these are the symptoms of hormone producing tumors, which are in red for each of the tumor type. And here is a list of chemicals that ought to be tested. It is important to point out that the CGA or the chromogranin A does not produce symptoms and it is a common chemical that is secreted by most if not all neuroendocrine tumors. The rest in this list are all hormones and they are specific to each tumor type. For pancreatic tumors which are functional, these are the types of tumors that produce hormones which are outlined over here as well as other substances and the tests required for each of these tumor types. So there's insulinoma causing the release of more insulin, gastrinoma causing release of gastrin, glucagonoma, which increases glucose levels, bipoma causing significant diarrhea and abdominal cramping pain, somatostatinoma, and so on. I have to point out that these tests are very special and their assay requires experience and a high level of expertise. In terms of scans, apart from the conventional CT and MRI scans, which are hugely useful, the NET, the neuroendocrine tumors, benefit from SRS-based scans. Let's find out what they are. Somatostatin is a naturally occurring hormone, and the neuroendocrine tumors, by far the great majority, have a receptor for somatostatin. And it is this part that is utilized in the SRS scans, somatostatin receptor scintigraph. It is also the basis that is used to allow somatostatin statin and related products to be used in treatment. So when somatostatin attaches to a tumor cell, somatostatin hence is bonded to a molecule that has radioactivity. And then a camera called a gamma camera is used for the whole body to get a picture about where the activity is most focused. This allows to confirm the diagnosis, locate the primary tumor and it spread and it also allows to assess suitability for treatments by, by confirming that these receptors exist on the tumor itself. The two types over here, octreotide is a slightly older version and the gallium scan is the latest. Let's look at some examples. This is an example of the octreotide scan which is similar to somatostatin and over here you can see the gamma camera picking up activity at the front and the back over a period of time and finally showing up tumor which was not visible on conventional imaging. A further refinement of this is the so-called gallium scan which I'll show you next. This is a gallium scan which utilizes the latest techniques in picking up tumors and then superimposing them on a CT scan. So over here, you can see the primary tumor in the pancreas would spread to the liver. And then that is very clearly shown on the CT scan, primary tumor, and then multiple spots in the liver confirming that this is a neuroendocrine tumor. Now we move to another important topic, is the biopsy, which is all important in neuroendocrine tumors to determine the grade and how is that done. The grade is determined by looking at the tumor in a microscope in a high power field and trying to find cells that are actively dividing. The tumor is then graded as G1, very good prognosis, to G2, intermediate prognosis, to G3, poor prognosis, as more and more cells are found to be dividing as one goes up the scale. The other parameter is the differentiation. This looks at individual cells 
and how these correlate with the cell which they originated from. So those that look very much like the original tissue are called well differentiated. The moderate are in between and the poorly differentiated look nothing like the original cells. And this forms three buckets of G1 with well, G2 with moderate and G3 with poor a differentiation to give information on how the tumours would behave and what treatments would be appropriate for the patient. This too requires special skill and expertise in those who evaluate these slides. Last and by no means the least is the genetic testing. In certain types of tumours, patients are prone to multiple tumours arising in families forming clusters, condition called multiple endocrine neoplasia. There are, there are other genetic associations as well and patients with specific tumors would trigger the genetic testing for themselves and their immediate families to look for these genes. This culminates a brief overview of some of the special tests required in assessment of neuroendocrine tumors. If you have any comments please do share.